Hello everyone and welcome back to Punting Pioneer. I'm Corbin Hostler and this is Mono Green Beatdown. Good old fashioned Mono Green Stompy right here. We're going to cast some creatures and we're going to attack for a bunch of damage here with this deck. This is a beautiful Mono Green deck made possible by some of the newer cards we've gotten in green recently. I'm looking at you, the Great Hinge, Primal Might. These are great cards right here. These cards allow you to pump they allow you to fight things great hinge of course does everything draws cards pumps your team gains your life this really gets you going but another one this this build makes use of collected companies so let's go through the deck we start at the one drop spot with the eight elves you've kind of become accustomed to in pretty much any green deck in the format for land of war elves for elvish mystic then we've got the two drops for any tree emissary because you know what it's free to play this thing gets your aggro out there it's also two devotion uh, and scavenging is generically powerful. But now we get to the three drop spot, and this is where we've got some some different stuff. And this is really what you want to do. You want to go mana dork on turn one, three drop on turn two. So we've got some fun ones here. Got a love struck beast because I love this card. But here's an addition: Garrick's Harbinger, hexproof from black. We do combat damage to a player or planeswalker. Look at that many cards we drop in the library. You can put a creature or Garrick into your hand. So a four three for three with a lot of upside not just so upside but a lot of upside doesn't get hit by fatal push or anything like that very very powerful card ronis the indomitable now this one does all kinds of stuff it's got all the abilities can't attack unless you have another creature with power four or greater but you know what that's something we can do you might have noticed garrett's harbinger that does it seal leaf champion this is kind of a classic at this point but a five four for three that does it and this one as well, the, the Yorvo Lord of Garenbrake. It's a 4-4, but this one grows quite a bit. And you'll notice all of these creatures we just talked about, they all come into play off of Collected Company. The only creature we have that can't is Galta, because you can't play Mono Green without playing Galta, right? So that's the deck, everybody. Mono Green Beatdown. It's going to be fun. Look how many forests we're playing. You're just going to classic basic forests over there. But you know what? There's a little bit of spice. We get the Hash Up Oasises that can pump things. We get the Nykthos to make a bunch of extra mana with all this devotion. And there's a Castle Gambrig in there because why not? Cyborg, fairly straightforward for this format at least. Damping Spheres, uh, Blossoming Defenses. You can kind of guess where this stuff goes, right? We want to defend against removal. We need to combat the uh, Graveyard decks with the Soul Guide Lantern or the Combo decks with a Damping Sphere. Rex Age, Back to Nature when you want to blow up Enchantments. Heroic Intervention against the Blue White Board Wipes and Shifting Ceratops when you need to attack. And keep your spells from getting countered. So everybody, mono green beatdown here in Pioneer. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Corbin Hostler, as always, with Cool Stuff Inc. So let's hop into the games. All right, mono green beatdown. I think this is a mulligan, though, because with no one drop and just this to play for the first two turns, that doesn't seem quite good enough to me. Um, I mean, I don't know that this hand is honestly much better, but look, we can throw the Galt away, and at least this hand if it gets up to four mana, is going somewhere. So, uh, sorry, my opponent's talking to me in chat here, saying, hey, well, you know what? Hello, and you're gonna be in this match. Well, we're gonna start with our scavenging units on turn two here, the Seal Leaf Champion on turn three. It's a slow hand, but both hands were slow, and look, sometimes you're not gonna have the ideal draws. At least, this one either draws cards that do things, or draws lands, in which case, which is perfectly fine, because now, while Scavenging News and the Seal Leaf Champion, that curve, especially on the draw, is much, much worse without a a one-drop, without an elf, it can really be made up for by the fact that double Collected Company, which we now have the mana for, the two turns after that, it's just going to flood the board out, and I don't know what our opponent's up to here. It looks like they're likely holding up a Bone Crusher Giant. If I were to guess, so we'll probably see. Yep, there you go. Stomp on the scavenging news. That's fine though. The alternative is not playing it. Um, and you know, which that'll be fine. But again, we're leaning on the collective companies. We're gonna have to exchange some kind of resources back and forth with our opponent. Let's at least be mana efficient. And I'll tell you what, that is an interesting one. I haven't seen this before out of a, a Gruel beatdown deck. Grumgully the Generous. It's a three, three for three. Each other non-human gets a plus one counter. Well. That will be distributing some counters, I'll say that. All right. Just chatting with our opponent a little bit here. This looks like a perfectly fine draw here, a Steel Leaf Champion. I'm most concerned about our opponent basically being able to 
just power through our board and deal enough damage just quickly before we can really kind of get set up here. That said, if they don't have an answer immediately to the Steel Leaf Champion, it holds the board down for at least a turn. I mean, the Bone Crusher, remember, is going to be a 5 4. So it's actually going to be a very large Bone Crusher Giant, thanks to the Grum Goalie. The question then is uh, where we go from here, what we hit off the Collected Company. Because while this deck is a great Collected Company deck and it's one of my favorite cards, I don't know if it's the strongest Collected Company hits I've ever seen, right? We can hit Mana Dorks, which aren't great here. Now, we can hit some big ones as well, but our opponent's also got some big creatures. So this is going to be actually a really interesting match, uh, honestly. That said, we are uh, drawing all the lands, so no more lands, please. I am going to attack. I think we want to be the beat down here, uh, especially considering our opponent. Um, yeah, I believe they were on the play, so I actually think they missed on their fourth land there. Uh, so that works out for us, but that also means their hand is all gas. So what that tells me is, given that we, I mean, we're not exactly flooded here. We have you know, basically one more than we, we need, uh, but it means our opponent's hand is all gas, and if the game lasts another six, seven turns, they're probably going to have more resources than we do. However, also due to the fact that Collected Company is instant speed here, we can really actually put our opponent to some pretty tough choices. They didn't block with the Bone Crusher Giant, so they're at 15, and it doesn't look like they have a fourth land. So if we hit a nice Collected Company here, you know, a Yorvo, something along those lines, uh, we're going to be able to swing for quite a bit. My opponent, though, actually opting to slow down here Filling the board with two two land or elves. It's not the worst idea I've ever seen. Let's see what company gets us. My opponent attacked into it. And this can attack and block, as a matter of fact. So there you go. This is what we want. Now I can get a blocking love struck beast here. Uh or I, it's uh that or an elf, so I guess the elf gives me five six mana. That's still not even enough to do both things, so. Yeah, I guess Love Struck Beast and Ronus it is. Perfectly reasonable for this combat, though. Look, I just get to block the Love Struck Beast on the Bone Crusher. The Ronus gets to eat the Grum Goalie here. And uh, that, I'm not going to say it was a bad attack from our opponent, uh, but it was not great. <laughs> My opponent said, oh, magic gods, let it be land when I spun the wheel on that collected company. Sorry, friend. Not quite. All right, well, let's go ahead and uh, I guess it's just time to attack. Swing for 10. Turns out that is a thing we can do. Also, I can make six mana. Wait a minute, is this lethal? 14. I think I have 14 points right here. Because look at this, actually. I can activate the Castle Garenberg to get 6 green mana. I can use activate abilities of creatures, including the Ronus. You know, my opponent can't even block the Steel Leaf Champion. This is a really, really rough position for them to be in. The fact that we're just sandbagging and collecting company is obviously the icing on top, but that attack just did not work out for them. Like I said, I wanted to be the beatdown, and uh, that decision worked out well. So I'm, I am going to pass here. I could have pumped up the, the Seal Leaf Champion, of course. Uh, Ronus can't pump itself, but I get a company here, so that's all perfectly fine with me. Our opponent has a land, so they have five mana right now. But this is sort of the, the way we needed the last few turns to go. We ended up way ahead in the resource advantages. They're going to fire off their own main phase collected company. What in the world is that? Okay, sure. Metallic Mimic naming Goblin, I guess. Interesting deck. Red Green Goblins, Gruel Goblins. I like it. Well, they'll come in here with the Goblin. We'll see what Collected Company number two gets us. So long as this doesn't whiff, we should be in a pretty good spot to close it out on our turn with the Ronus activations. You know, assuming we get something here. <laughs> our opponent didn't even want to see it. Let's see what the top six would have been. One, two, three. Well, look at that. It would have been a Garrick's Harbinger and a Aronis, which is legendary. So it actually would have been a pretty bad collected company. Might have still been enough, but it would have been pretty bad. All right, red, green, huh? This feels like the stuff we want.
Actually, gonna cut a Garrick's Harbinger here. Our opponent does not have any black in their deck. It's only got I only I say for a three drop. It's got three toughness, so it's not the best blocker on our team. Well, let's see if we can come up with a nice hand here, though. Game one went, I would say, pretty perfectly according to plan, and we'll see if uh, game two can duplicate that. That hand worked out, right? Double collected company can make a lot of things look very good. We would have actually hit with that second one. Another big creature and then swung with three big creatures. Yeah, I think even with everything our opponent had going on with the Ronus activation and the fact that I think we had another card in our hand, um, another creature in our hand or something, we could have, we, we weren't out of gas yet. So we had plenty to do in that one. Hopefully game two will go a little, uh, a, a little more smoothly with the mulligans, but the same outcome, right? That said, we uh, will not have a smoother draw with the mulligans because this one's got to go. And unfortunately, so does this one. So, all right, let's head on down to five. Now, I am only running 21 lands in this deck. You could easily run more, but with the eight mana dorks, it's not the same as running 28 lands, obviously, but it's not that far off from running, say, 23, 24, which is typically where you kind of see a deck. So, haven't had an opener with a mana dork yet, and I guess we still don't, but I have to keep this one, and I'm going to ship... I'm going to ship a Steel Leaf Champion and Ronus, and I'm going to attempt to play a Steel Leaf Champion on turn three and a Primal Might to take care of their board. I think this is the only combination of cards that can really get us there. Uh, that said, our opponent playing Skirk Prospect Prospector now, they also mulliganed. Now, nowhere near the same amount, obviously, uh, but Collected Company isn't bad either. If we can draw some lands here, find some lands on top of our deck, this hand has potential. And when you're on a mode of five, right, that's kind of all you all you can ask for. I think our opponent, for what it's worth, though, did go to six. <laughs> that said, the, the Gruel Goblins might get us here. I mean, how terrifying is an early Rabble Master against our deck? We don't have just a ton of answers to it. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of bad draws for us right now. Land is actually what I want. Um, but we're still not going to be doing anything. And that means that we are just in danger of losing the game next turn if we miss a land drop. Functionally, that Yorvo is not much different than Seal Leaf Champion in play, but we could just be done for here. If a Gravel Master hits and we don't have an answer to it. All right. Instead, it's a Clothus with no fuel. Nothing in the graveyard for it to, to even eat right now. I guess that's about as much as we can hope for. We find land all of a sudden. We we got a shot here. Show me land. That is a land. That's how we do it. Let's get the Yorvo out there. That's a 4-4. Four, four. We have a plan, everybody. It doesn't get hit by Bone Crusher Giant. If our opponent has other removal, our opponent has other removal for it. But, I mean, they're down to two cards in hand. <coughs> Excuse me. And a Metallic Mimic, even the second one at a 3-2, that doesn't beat us yet. If their last card is, say, just another land, and it looks like it could be, we might find a way to dig out of this, especially considering, if I wanted, I could Primal Might to actually use as a removal spell here. Instead, though, um, okay, well, I guess I have to play the Ronus here. Because I'm going to end up with red mana after playing the Burning Tree. But the Burning Tree will, I believe, grow the Yorvo. Turn it into a 5-5 five, five here. And then, uh, yeah, with the Ronus, it'll be a 6. So this at least makes it big enough to swing with, with pretty much with impunity. Not that I think our opponent was going to get around to blocking it before, but this, this obviously looks even better for us here. And the beatdown begins. It took a little while to get going, I admit, but our opponent's at 14. Plothus is just doing nothing at all. This is a good card. It is a very powerful card. Drains from the graveyard, keeps graveyards in line, it can ramp you. This card does quite a bit, but in this circumstance, it's not working out great for them. Now, we still want to keep drawing lands because I want to cast a collected company. I have the Primal Might. I have the Ronus to give my creatures Trample, which could uh, end up being pretty relevant here. So they hit the fifth land. That's a bit of a flood. This is why, though, everybody at home, 
it is frustrating. We mulliganed in the first game, and it was rough. We, we mulliganed in the second game. It is frustrating to mulligan all the time. It is frustrating to not have good hands, especially when you're on camera, right, and you're trying to record. But games like this are why you do it. This is why even when you mull down to four, you keep playing the game because you have no idea what your opponent is going through. <laughs> My opponent says, after owning Uro decks all night, it's nice to see some janky deck killing my kill streak. That's what we do here on Punting Pioneer and Mining Modern. We play the jank, but we win with the jank at least sometimes. At least sometimes. This one isn't quite over yet, but our opponent flooded out very hard. The Mana Dork is not a goblin, and it does nothing for them. Uh, and now we get to do something. I assume our opponent is chatting and has not moved through the stop on our turn here. But we're going to probably just attack and play the Steel Leaf here. I don't... The problem we're going to run into, and it is, you know, actually going to be a real problem, is that the Clothis, as our opponent starts the chump block, the Clothis is going to start eating our life total by, by exiling the things from their graveyard and possibly our graveyard as well. Uh, that's a that's a pretty solid draw, though. I'm not going to lie. That said, I think we just have to keep attacking and see what happens. I mean, Clothis is going to start draining us. And even more po problematic, perhaps, and this is why it's important to, to present lethal here, which we're doing, um, our opponent could just block with Clothis here pretty soon. Now, I assume because they sent, put the lane where else on the Ronus, I won't have lethal here. Let's do the math, though. We can make it eight. Try to pull over for seven and deal two. I can deal nine, put my opponent to five. That seems worse than the collected company, so I think we just passed the turn here. This is huge, actually. I, I don't know what our opponent's line to winning was. I actually think they were supposed to chump block the Ronus with the 2-1 Metallic Mimic. They needed to keep... They, they would have got the fuel in their graveyard to, to, to eat with the Clothis, but they also would have had four Devotion still uh, and been able... They've been at a little life total, but Clothis would have been starting to pull them out. And importantly, they would have been able to collect a company into some blockers and turn Clothis into a creature, because turning Clothis into a creature and, and being able to dominate the battlefield with it while it drains us is, I think, their path to victory. Uh, but now, with, with going down on two Devotion, I, I don't really know what they're looking for. Especially if our collected company hits good creatures. And a Garrick's Harbinger. And a Burning Tree is not bad. Well, this will do it. That's a big Uro. It's an 8-8. Eight, eight, uh, Uro. Yorvo. Um, and now we can use the... Uh, eh, we have the cheap Galta. But we can use the Ronus, I think, to end the game here. Just attack with everything. So if we give this trample and make it a 10, I mean, this game's over, right? <laughs> I think if our opponent were to have a collected company, I don't know what they would be looking for. I don't know how you get out of this at this point. Uh, but I think this one should pretty much be wrapped up. I like Gruel Goblin, so Gruel Goblin sounds like a an interesting concept and clothis is pretty good i mean turn two rabble masters are no joke in any format you play a turn two rabble master is something you have to take seriously and i hey if your deck is capable of that and then the fact you can even go turn two grim goalie grum goalie turn three rabble master there's some power there uh so that was a fun one that was a fun match but this is what our deck does this mono green deck can go bigger than any creature deck out there and that's exactly what we did that's a great match to start it off with here. Mono Green Beatdown and, and Pioneer. Let's jump into the next one. All right, time to beat down some more with Mono Green, and we are on the play. This is an interesting hand right here. I think I'm going to ship it, because we don't have a lot of mana to take advantage of the Primal Mites. It doesn't have a Mana Dork. I mean, look, we're just never going to get Mana Dorks in our hands, but I think this is the hand. I think it's the one we're going to have to keep here. I'll probably put back the Great Hinge. Uh... And I'll tell you what, I guess see where things go. We're on the play, so that's a good start. Sooner or later, we'll have Mana Dorks in our openers, right? I have to imagine it makes the game a little bit easier. 
Two lands and a land of war elf. It's all I want. Any other combination of cards after those three, and I think it's a good hand. Uh, meanwhile, our opponent, uh, Overwhelmed Apprentice, here going to mill us for two. Attached to a scry, attached to a one-two body. Talk about power creep, am I right? I loved this card in Throne of Eldraine Limited. Uh, an experience which was somewhat soured for me based on the fact that uh, in... All right, well, I'll tell you what. At least we can play that. That's actually perfectly fine here. Uh, I, my Throne of Eldraine experience was slightly soured by the fact that on Arena, at the time, there weren't... Um, you couldn't do drafts against other people. You could only do them against the bots, and the bots did not take the mill cards. So every other deck, or in some cases, you play a draft every single deck you play against... Was just mono blue mill or blue white mill or blue black mill uh, in Throne of Eldraine for a solid like month and a half, two months before they adjusted how the bots worked on there. It was actually pretty pretty bad. I have no idea what this attack is from our opponent, so I'm going to block. It is a chilling trap. Okay, our opponent is playing wizards and they wanted to cycle their card. Works for me. Mono blue wizards. Okay. Land? Don't need it, but I don't hate it, that's for sure. Uh, and it means I can attack with my, uh, means I can attack with my Elvish Mystic. Alright, we'll play out of Yorvo here. And, uh, get the beat down on. Send the team in for three. Pass with a 4-4 four, four, and make our opponent deal with it here. We've got, it, it's possible, you could argue I go with the Garrick's Harbinger there. Uh, instead of the Yorvo, you know, value the ability to maybe connect with it over the counters on a Yorvo, but... I don't really know what our opponent is up to. I think I want to just play the Yorvo and just try to beat them, right? Just try to just try to attack. If they have counter spells, then they have counter spells. So what? But if they don't, if they have other spells, then the Yorvo will grow a little bit here. So Hexproof from Black, not particularly relevant on the Harbinger. Let's see what they want to do. Oh wow. Merfolk come a call in Harbinger of the Tides, bouncing our, our Elvish Mystic, I would assume. This isn't very good for them, though. This is not where you want to be with that Harbinger of the Tides. Now, I've played a lot of Harbinger of the Tides. That thing's a Merfolk. There's a hot minute where this was very, very good in Modern. Don't know if we're there anymore, but bouncing my Elvish Mystic, not a big deal, especially if I draw fourth land, which, of course, I did. Well, now we'll play out the Harbinger, and we will continue the beatdown coming in for eight this time. Here on turn four. Not bad at all. We keep mulliganing, and we keep putting up some aggressive hands anyway. So, what does our opponent do here? You know, Mono Blue Wizards does not have, I think, a lot of great answers to our creatures once they're in play. This seems to me like a... Uh, play your, your Overwhelmed Apprentice, set up your draws, counterspell things for a wild type deck. Not a deck that's good once you get behind on board. And you can see here, Gadwick the Wise End for one. This is a way you take control of the board, actually. Casting blue spells on our turn. Tapping down our creatures is, is pretty powerful in the abstract. In practice, we're really far ahead. And it's going to be difficult for them to, to get much value out of it. Now, that thing doesn't do much for us, uh, but let's attack. You know, I could play the Steel Leaf Champion there, which is, you know, maybe relevant. Makes the Yorvo lethal on top of the uh, Burning Tree. Actually forces us a second block. That might be relevant. Um, but I guess it does. A second block, that is, if they don't want me to get the Garrick's trigger. So, this is all fine. I'll just play out uh, the Steel Leaf Champion Put our opponent down to seven. They chump past the turn. I don't know. Of I mean, they could play like Whelming Wave or something bizarre. I can't think of anything in mono blue that gets us here. You know, blue white, settle the wreckage. Uh, you know, uh, supreme verdict, that sort of thing. But mono blue, Nabin here, the Dean of Iteration. Well, I wasn't a great student, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, so I do. Typically get scared when I, you know, hear of the Dean coming. But this one doesn't worry me so much. Nabin Dean of Iteration here. Our opponent can tap some stuff down on our turn. That's true. But we have four, three rather, big attackers. 
And uh, that's something we get to follow up with afterwards. It's got some fodder. Well, let's see what they want to do here. Because they have to cast spells to tap down things with Gadwick. That's the only way they can attempt to get back into the game. Is to super slow us down that way. And you know what? A Merfolk Trickster... I mean, it certainly is buying them time. This is what Mono Blue can do. Merfolk Trickster... Gadwick taps one down. The Merfolk Trickster lands and taps down another. Our opponent's playing all kinds of cool Merfolk over there. Might just be Mono Blue Devotion, right? The Chilling Trap. They may have just been looking for some early interaction. Chilling Trap will cycle a lot of the times. Chilling Trap will win you some combat. I mean, it kind of makes sense once you have a Mono Blue Wizard deck. And as it stands, by the way, I have no attackers. Why don't I have any attackers? They only tapped on... Oh, the Naven. I see. I did trigger twice. They tricked through two things. I see. Interesting. Okay. Well, in that case, I guess we just move to the second main phase here. Play out our scavenging news, pass the turn, and next turn we'll have four big creatures they have to deal with. They've got Castle Vantress for days over there, so they get a scry. So, you know, if they can find a way with the three cards in their hand to make the game go for a very long time, they'll be in an okay spot. And you know what? Look at this. A Docent of Perfection. A 5-4 flyer. I played as a commander. A 5-4 flyer that creates wizards. 1-1 one, one blue wizards when you cast an instant or sorcery. And then if you have three or more wizards, flip it. And then when it's flipped, your wizards get plus two, plus one, and flying. It gives them all the Delver of Secrets transform boost. Our opponent has a bunch of wizards in play. If they have a one mana instant right now, they get to flip them. They could swing for so much damage. We'll see what happens. I get to turn the scavenging news into a 5-5. Five five, so that is uh, pretty big at least. All right, let's see what we hit. A removal spell would be great. A Primal Might here. You know what? Aronis is not bad because I'll tell you what. I can actually activate the castle here. This is huge, as a matter of fact. I can play the Aronis, and I can, you know, if things go the way I want them to here, I, I can immediately use it to pump the Yorvo. It's going to be an 8-8 once Aronis hits. It's going to be, oh, no. They had it. They had the opt. I had a plan, and that plan just got a heck of a lot worse. Our opponent's going to have a lot of damage. Gadwick gets to tap the Steel Leaf Champion. The Op's going to resolve. All right, Ronus is going to hit the battlefield now. They got a big board here, right? This thing's a 6-5. Jeez. The team is huge, but... But you know what? Uh, we have a 10. We have a 10-8. What happens if I swing with everything? That's just not even that good, is it? The final iteration would block the Harbinger. Let's say they chump block the Scoos with the two toughness thing. Then they get to put seven, nine toughness in front of the Yorvo to take one trample. Plus three more, I believe. That's four. I don't think I have it. Uh, the game is not lost for us by any means, but it is getting there. I think it's just the Yorvo that I can attack with. Nothing else gives me even reasonable, I think, opportunity for success here, but... We will get in a lot of damage. This is the play, right? We'll get in a lot of damage with this Yorvo hit. They'll have to throw away something. Hopefully they throw away enough to not just have lethal on the crackback. I didn't even do that math. But 9, 13, 19, 22. I count 22 damage they have flying on the crackback here. So fortunately, they're not likely to kill us. <coughs> it looks like they're actually lining up blocks on the Yorvo to try to take it off the battlefield. And I have to say, I think that that's better for me. That's what they're going to do here. 
I cannot do anything to make it bigger, so... Alright, Yorvo down. But, two of our opponent's creatures down, and our opponent down to two life. So, now we're in a situation where everything but the Elvish Mystic is itself lethal. And anything is lethal with the Ronus activation, and which, remember, we can do twice. So, getting that big hit in was huge. I feel much better about this game after seeing how that happens. Now... Things are far from over here, because our opponent gets to opt. They get to make a bunch of wizard tokens. And uh, those wizard tokens can do some blocking, that's for sure. So we... Wait, do they still get them? Yeah, they still do. Okay. It's not just on the front side. It's a good card. I played as a commander. I have a Karanos deck, blue-red. Instance and sorceries kind of thing. It's fun. I've never actually flipped this before, though. <laughs> Narumeha. Okay. They get to copy the opt. Well, I don't think they have lethal, so I guess I'm happy that they're doing all this on their turn. All right, doesn't Narumeha have flash? This thing's got flash. Doing it on my turn, tap my creatures down, would be much, uh, much scarier. I mean, I guess they needed to cast the opt because they're digging for something here. But what are they looking for? I mean, the Ronus is going to go the distance against... I mean, not any number of tokens, but a lot of tokens with them so low. And they kept it on top. Well, that's probably pretty bad. I mean, if that card, if that last card's a trickster, they might have us. At least as it stands right now, though, I do get attacked with the team. Ronus can pump anything but itself. Giving Trample, of course, being the huge thing here. I get two of my creatures Trample and pump them twice and then hope that that's enough my opponent's got a lot of blockers over there but uh it, it doesn't work out quite the way they want now this is an interesting one what are they going to harbinger here my scoos okay I think that's all right. I think they were supposed to hit the Ronus, so I could only give one creature trample. I don't know. They might have enough blockers that it doesn't matter. It's going to be an interesting attack step for us, that's for sure. And they're going to have to throw a lot of stuff at our team. And then hopefully we have a scavenging news at the end of that if we don't win. To, I guess, try to pull it out. I, I mean, it doesn't make sense to me that we would beat this, but we are certainly trying... All right, team goes in. I can give the Garrick's Harbinger uh, trample for what it's worth here. Nice little combo, I'd say. Look at that many cards from the top of your library. You can get a Garrick or a creature. I mean, not that we particularly need creatures off the top of our library right now. We just need this attack step to work. This is, I don't envy my opponent having to do the math here. If I was to very briefly attempt to do it, you, you put one creature in front of Ronus like that. The problem is you have to put so many you have to put so much toughness in front of everything else. You put a final iteration, say, in front of the Elvish Mystic. You put the Gadwick in front of the Burning Tree. You'd only go to one from that, from a double pump there. Oh, that one makes them dead, because I can deal... This block isn't good enough. This block isn't good enough either. <laughs> I can pump the burning tree there to six and get in for two for lethal. I don't think they have it. I think that the Ronus is going to be too good here. We'll see. Sooner or later, they're going to realize that the Harbinger of the Tides has to block one of the bigger toughness creatures to give him a shot. This doesn't win. These blocks don't work. These blocks aren't even close to working. I don't even know if there is a way for the blocks to work. But this ain't it. All right, we will pump this thing up to a six so we can trample over for three.
I might have scooped if it was my opponent. That math was horrible. It's not even trample math where you can just add up all... If all your creatures have trample and overrun or whatever, you just add up all the toughness, you add up all the uh, attacking damage, and you just subtract. It's nice and easy to figure it out. But when you have to account for me giving the creatures trample after that, that's a bit of a different ball game. But you know what? Uh, I don't envy them having to do that math. Math is for blockers, though. And that's why we're attacking. And that's why these shifting ceratops are going to be good now. I bet the blossoming defense is also pretty strong. What do we want to do? What do we want to do? Never draw mana dork. I may as well cut one anyway, right? I'll give this a shot, I guess. Uh, maybe we're supposed to do something like cut the Galta, but, I mean, I'm never going to cut the Galta, so, you know, we're not, we don't have to worry about that. I will say this is one of the worst Burning Tree Emissary decks I've ever seen. I don't know that there's anything better in that slot. There's probably not, but it is one of the worst ones I've ever seen because uh, it gives you green-red, and then we have lots of triple-green spells. It just, It's just not really... Uh, very smooth in the deck. And it's not that good, I think. Like, the deck... Uh, this deck is, is not a swarmier opponent to that deck. It's... Look at all these big creatures. Everything's a 4-4. Four, four, everything's a 5-5. Five, five. I mean, the Burning Tree just kind of gives you a 2-2. Two, two. It, it, it works, right? It's sort of an ag aggressive card in that sense. In our deck that's beating down. I mean, it certainly can take a pump from Aronis and, and get in there. But I do wonder if there's something else at that 2-drop spot you might want. I mean... I don't know. It's mono green, so your options are, of course, limited. But keep in mind, the original, you know, the uh, mono green is not brand new by any stretch. But there are some new cards in it. Uh, and they don't all run Galta, right? I mean, I'd rather run all the Galtas I can. <laughs> all right, well, let's see what we can do this time around. This hand, by the way, is much better. This is the kind of hand we were asking for. Turn one Elvish Mystic. Turn two, Steel Leaf Champion. Turn three, Shifting... Well, probably turn three, Company. Turn four, Shifting Ceratops, when I can give it haste. Without our opponent... That last game got really scary because our opponent was able to set up an engine. Not just a dose and a perfection. Wow, they missed on the land. Oh, that's a disaster for them. They also had the, the Gadwick engine, which kept them alive for a while, but... Look, if you overwhelmed Apprentice, uh, miss on lands, and then opt and, and, and miss on lands, I, I feel bad for you. I'm sorry. And they went bottom again here, and they still missed. Ooh. Oof. I'm sorry, friend. I've been on the other side of it, and you know what? While it did not work out uh, maybe exactly the way you would have liked it this game, it was kind of a non-game for my opponent here. We've had our share of those. But the good news... Uh, I guess the, the silver lining, <laughs> if you're them, is our hand here was insane. Turn two, Steel Leaf Champion. Turn three, Collected Company. If we hit a land, it's a turn four, Shifting Ceratops with haste. If not, it's a just Aronis or whatever, right? This was a crazy good hand from us that I think maybe even my opponent's best hand may not have been able to keep up with. So let's go ahead and fire off a company and see what happens. <laughs> wow. Not a whiff. Um, but, uh, it's not that far off either. I am going to take the, uh, the, the land of war elves here just so I make sure to have that shifting ceratops mana if we miss on land, which you can see we did. So, uh, this still works out. All right, let's give this thing haste. Turn the team sideways, get in there for 12. Not lethal, but pretty good. And, uh, I mean, I guess our opponent just has no access to board wipes. That's why it's so, it's just such an impossible spot for them to keep up when they stumble at all. You, you, you know, bounce spells and tap spells. They can work for a while. And, and look, Tidebinder Mage is insane. This is clearly why my opponent kept his hand. If I were to guess, it was some combination of, uh, Overwhelmed Apprentice and Tidebinder Mage. And this is another awesome Merfolk. I miss, I truly miss the days of when this card was good. I was tapped down Tarmogoyfs with it in Modern. Back when that was a relevant play in the format. Uh, little too late for our opponent in this one, though. 
I get to play another land here and uh, I guess just run out another Shifting Ceratops because why not? There we go. That'll do it. That is two down. That was a bit of a, a freebie in the sense that our opponent didn't get to play, but we had a great game one. Uh, and you can see the Shifting Ceratops do work there. This, it took a while, but this is the kind of hand you want to see from the deck. And we keep winning even without it, which is a great sign when it comes to the power level of a deck. Especially when that deck is as sweet as Mono Green and Pioneer. So let's see if we can close it out with a win. All right, it's time for more Mono Green and Pioneer. Let's see. This is our first sighting of the Great Hinge, so you know what I'm in. This seems like a reasonable hand. We talked about Burning Tree Emissary. It, this is a hand where it's actively good, I think. I mean, we have the turn one Elvish Mystic, the turn two uh, Burning Tree into a Scooze. So pretty strong. Now, my opponent Mulligan to six, but I have to say, Hallowed Fountain, really not exactly the kind of... Uh, a matchup I think we're looking for with this deck. <clears throat> but let's see what we can do. A second Great Hinge. Also not exactly what I'm looking for. Let's see if we can resolve these early spells, though. I mean, we don't get censored, which is nice. Uh, the Land of War Elves allowing us to very expertly play around that, and we can attack here. So, I mean, this is the plan. We put five power into play by turn two, and this is a game where... The Burning Tree could do some work because the way we win this one is, is with the five power we have in play right now doing some work. It is going to be a struggle to continue to resolve spells uh, against an opponent that, that you know, <laughs> looks like their board does. So this actually produces a little bit of mana. I'm in. Well, we can continue to play around um, Sensor, so let's do it. In fact, I have two mana open. Now, the um, the Ronus... Oh, wow, a Spell Queller. Interesting. I don't love this. I'm going to attack. They're going to block, and then we're going to eat it with our Scavenging News and have a 3-3 Scavenging News that can actually attack. <laughs> or they're going to take two. I guess I'm okay with that outcome as well. So, here's where things stand, though. We're going to untap, and we're going to have one, two, three, four, five, six mana with the Nykthos uh, that we are going to use to cast the Great Hinge. Now, our opponent played in Afara. Now, this is a bit of a throwback. This card used to be played in in some formats. It's it's not that hard when you're playing Spellquellers in, in the type to get it to seven devotion to be a creature, but um, also if you had a... a a creature under your control last turn you draw a card now this has very little on the card advantage and advantage engines of today but when you're in blue white it's probably not that many effects like this okay well let's see what happens here i guess this means this is free i don't know that putting more things into in fact this is probably bad now that i think about it yeah no it was that's okay though We'll get in there with our burning trees, see if our opponent wants to block one. The important thing is that the uh, the Great Hinge resolved at all, right? That we that we were able to get into play. My first thought, and I went a little fast there, was, oh yeah, Land of War Elves is free with Nykthos. I've played so many years, I've ingrained that one devotion is is equal. Um, you know, it's a net, net zero. Cost you nothing, right? If you're going to activate Nykthos that turn. But in that case, I actually would have been better off holding on to it a little... Uh, so I could have got an extra card out of the deal. Just now say we miss on land drops. It's actually going to feel kind of bad. I don't know what our opponent's up to, by the way. This is not a blue-white control deck, which is probably good for me. I would assume that a blue-white control deck would be a worse matchup. This is Angel of Invention, though. It's kind of annoying. Let's see if we hit a land. Oh, I see. It's the beginning of each upkeep, so you can actually farm some value off of it with instant speed stuff. That's kind of cool. They're getting closer on the Devotion, too, by the way. It's at six. Now, that means this is a great draw for us, uh, honestly. This is going to be a lot of mana for our Devotion to green. I wish our creatures had Trample. Alas, they do not. However... 
We may as well just give Atlanta or Elves uh, plus nine, plus nine, right? And then attack. Actually, <coughs> excuse me, that's not quite true. Because I want to eat, eat them with scavenging news. So we're actually just going to give this land or elves plus six, plus six. It'll still be good enough. All right, X is currently six. That works for me. And you know what else we get to do here? This is kind of sick. The Ronus is going to trigger the Great Hinge. The Ronus is going to give me the counter to get this uh, Garrick's Harbinger into play. It gets a counter, rather. But now I actually have three mana to... Let's see here. I think this is the attack. And bringing in this elf probably does nothing. All right, this is the attack. This means that I can activate Ronus on the 7-7 Elf when my opponent tries to chump block it, no doubt, and get in a nice chunk of damage. And I think that puts us in an okay position moving into the next one, and they're just actually going to do nothing here, huh? Well, if they're going to do nothing, that's fine. I'm just going to cast a Garrick's Harbinger. Our opponent's playing to the board. I expected, you know, Wraths, but that's not what came, so that's not what I'm going to play around. I very much like just drawing cards off of all of this. And now we even hitting the forest is not irrelevant because we can eat another creature with the scavenging news on their turn. And that's good enough for our opponent. Blue white. I wonder if it's um God Pharaoh's gift. That's what I that's what I'm concerned about seeing Angel of Invention. That's the, the place you most often see that card. So I'm actually gonna board in the Soul Guide Lantern here, assuming that our opponent has a gift to uh, maybe not gift to the afterlife, um uh, but they're on the the refurbished plane. Refur <laughs> it took me a minute there. Refurbished. I played that deck back in standard. Um, discard to chart a course, refurbish, that sort of thing. I think. I don't really know. Um, but we do have all the scavenging newses already. I like that. I don't know. I don't know what we want. I guess a shifting ceratops probably. I don't know if they have removal over there or not, but we'll give this a shot, I guess. I don't know if we would want, you know, the heroic intervention or anything like that, but I think this is okay. And I think this is a keep. I'm going to be honest, this hand is a little medium. I mean, double mana dork, double land. The aforementioned burning tree emissary, which is just okay sometimes. Uh, this hand is kind of going nowhere, but it has two big mana payoffs, so we're keeping it. It's missing the in-between right now. We've got... The Great Hinge, we've got Primal Might. We have things to sink mana into. What we don't have yet are ways to... Uh... Oh, this is interesting. I could just slam the Steel Leaf. Kind of want to. I'm going to. This is greedy. I could get censored, but we didn't see censor in game one, and it doesn't happen. It resolves. So, the reason I did this is just... Because of how strong it can be, right? Like, look at this. Turn three, Steel Leaf. Turn two, sorry, Steel Leaf Champion. I mean, it's going to be a turn three Great Hinge, people. It's insane. This is going to cost, instead of nine mana, it's going to cost... This is a great card, by the way. Catcher's Monument from our opponent. They can fill the board fast with this, and it combos with stuff like White Main Lion that can, you know, play and then pick stuff back up. It's a very powerful engine that we've used ourselves. But look at what we're doing. Turn two, Steel Leaf Champion is going to lead to turn three, Great Hinge, because it costs four mana, which we have, but it gets even worse than that because here comes the Burning Tree. We get to start all the triggers. And we even get to play a Land of War Elves out here as well. So uh, before we attack for five. Great turn for our opponent. Oketra's Monument is a powerful card, and it is actually pretty good against us, sort of in the abstract. But here in reality, in this game, where we popped off with a turn three Great Hinge, it's just too little, too late. And Deputy of Detention here, costing just two mana 
thanks to the discount, is powerful. This is very good. They're going to hit our Great Hinge with it. But that Great Hinge already drew us cards. It already pumped our creatures. The Selfless Spirit is a nice one for them. I, I will say that. Now, here's the problem for our opponent is uh, they, they don't, we don't have Trample or anything, but the Seal Leaf can't be blocked. So I just have so many things available to me right now. I, I'm just going to go for the Ronus and the Pump. Actually, I'm going to attack with both of these. Because what do I care if they chump block the uh, Burning Tree? And I'll just give the Burning Tree Trample. The, the Seal Leaf Champion, the upside coming in, because a 5-4 for 3 wasn't enough. Even back in Dominaria, I guess, which is sort of the quaint good old days now. But can't be blocked with creatures power two or less. That means no matter how many 1-1s one you get, even if you pump them with an Angel of Invention, it's not going to be enough. So this is an interesting block. I'll say that. I'm just going to pump my Steel Leaf Champion, honestly. I'd rather just do the damage to them. Because if I get the Deputy of Detention, who really cares about uh, the Burning Tree, right? I don't need to take out their tokens, especially when they just sacrifice the Selfless Spirit that we traded our uh, traded our Burning Tree for a Selfless Spirit. And I mean, honestly, I think that's a pretty good trade for me, uh, considering how far behind it leaves my opponent here. But the big one was our Ronus, and, and Reflector Mage is one of the best answers I think they could have to the Ronus. The problem is. The Steel Leaf Champions still can't be blocked by their board. I think their deck probably has a hard time in general making blockers for it at all. So this is just going to be difficult for them. I guess I can't attack a block with Ronus. So we'll take take their beat down, down to 19. And there's a second Steel Leaf. I do like that. Especially as I have uh, exactly enough mana for that. Oh no, I can't play it. It got Reflector Maged. Uh, that said, I think that's still okay. I think I attack with my 2-2 two -two Land of War Elves because we either are going to... I, I, I've got a lot of plans for this turn, honestly. This is going to work out okay for us. I mean, the, the best thing they can do is just take it. And instead, they're not going to do that. They're going to block it with the Reflector Mage. And the Reflector Mage was so good. Meaning we can't replay the Steel Leaf Champion next turn. That gives them ages. But the real problem, it looks like, might be Ronus for them. Because I get to use Ronus to pump the Llanowar Elf. This will take out the Reflector Mage. Does a little bit of damage to them to boot. But uh, more than that, now I just get to Primal my this Ronus for two. Uh, actually, I take that back. I'm going to Primal my... The Land of War, the Elvish Mystic for two. And fight the Deputy of Detention. To try to get back my Great Hinge yet again. Alright, they do have something. It's just a Spell Queller, though. I say just a Spell Queller. I mean, Spell Queller is good. Especially, um... It's sort of... I mean, look at the board. I can't attack or block, and they have, uh... Six, seven power in play. It's lethal in a couple turns. You know, this game's far from over. Especially when you start talking about a lifelinking angel of invention. That's a pretty powerful one right here. Now, what we have going for us is the fact that we have another primal might to fight, I guess, the deputy of detention to try to get our great hinge back. This is a tough spot for us. These tokens all have Vigilance. I mean, this is a big hit. Are we just dead? Dead next turn, right? Wow. Maybe getting Great Hinge back is not the way to go. Is there a way to go? Can we even win? I can Primal Might for zero, right? We can just fight this thing. Get the Great Hinge back. Have enough mana to play out both Steel Leaf Champions. I'll have eight life. I have four blockers at that point. I think I just die. I have to fight the stupid angel. Alt yeah, blocking's no good. I have to fight the angel. This is bad. This is bad all around. 
That second spell queller, I think, might have got us. Can't XP zero? Oh, I see. Okay. All right. Well, let's attempt again to get the deputy detention out of here. That did work. Let's see what we hit with this. A scavenging news is pretty good. This might be a ticket back in. Let's see if we hit a land here. For the other steel leaf. Oh, I already played a land. Okay. Oh no, I tapped my land wrong. Uh, I think I will use that to eat with the uh, scavenging news anyway. Well, let's let's just try to survive because this is what I realized is that why well, I say that the 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 spell queller from our opponent is still very problematic. But I think the steel leaf champions can get there because they can't be chump blocked by the rest of this. And then uh, I can give Trample with Ronus. So if we can survive, which I think I can. Hitting Scavenging News was big because I can eat all three of their creatures after blocks to go up to 11. So I can block four creatures. And I can't block these two flyers. So, I mean, regardless, we take five in the air. But then I block four of the ones on the ground. That's nine total. And I think I go up to 11. So I think we have the ability to end the turn at two. Unless, I guess, I think my opponent popping this would actually beat us. The Shevet Dunes is, I think, going to, to get us here if, if, if something else doesn't. What are we flipping Ormond? What are we ha We're flipping Westvale Abbey. Well, I guess that's pretty good. <laughs> I have nothing to say to that. That's why you make all those tokens, sacrifice five creatures, get a flying lifelink. Indestructible haste. I cannot, uh, I can't beat that. I can't beat that. I will. I actually. Well, can I? I mean, I can. I cannot die. There's no way I can deal with 17 damage, though, right? And I guess I die anyway if they come in with the flyers. All right. That was certainly an interesting game. On to game three. Would like some reclamation stages this time around. Just go a little more beatdown oriented here, right? Give something like this a shot, I guess. Still have access to our engines. Wish I had a little more removal, but let's see. I like this hand, but I don't think I can keep it. It's too slow. Four lands. This is better. It's not much better, but it is better. At least it does combine early game um, output, right? With uh, was going to have a nice turn too, with a late game engine. What we're missing is anything to bridge it. Was that the game we had turn? Might have been a different game. I might have be confusing the games there. I felt like we had a very powerful draw last game, and frankly, we kind of got smoked. The neat deck from our opponent. All right, well, that's a huge draw for us. Uh, absolutely game-changing draw. Seal Leaf Champion on turn three there for so many reasons. I mean, not only is it, a, is it a three draw, it's a creature to play. It's something to do with our third turn. But perhaps more importantly than that, it's, I, we, we, well, I guess, there's so many. We know it already gets through the tokens well. But more than that, it, it turns on the Great Hinge in our hand, which is something you know, we were kind of struggling with, right? The, uh, the We weren't able, going to be able to cast it without anything to bridge the gap. And now, well, we get to attack a little bit, but I get to play a Steel Leaf Champion a little slow. It's on turn three. But if we hit land, we get to play the Great Hinge plus Elvish Mystic after that. I didn't swing with the Scoos because uh, it is likely better to keep that Scoos around for as long as possible. I would say this game comes down to you know, whether or not they're able to get us with another uh, monument and get out of hand. It's not. It's a bugler. Okay.
And they revealed another Bugler. It's a good card. Got overshadowed because it basically got into Modern Humans and then Modern as a format kind of exploded in power level and made it look very silly very quickly. But it is a cool card. Alright, land please. Not a land. Not the worst thing ever. Alright, I cannot play this, right? It's cast... I can just click it and find out. Yeah, it costs four, which I cannot do, so... This is actually a pretty ugly turn for us, right? We have, we have nothing to do with our mana. Our opponent played a 2-3, which is apparently the bane of all of our attacks. Uh, so, <laughs> this is not where we want it to be. If we hit a land that turn, we get to play the Great Hinge into an Elvish Mystic on tap with a Great Hinge and Cast Collected Company, and the game at that point is massively in our favor. Instead, well, we're going to play it a little differently here. We've got our opponent setting up, but they didn't have the Monument on turn 3, and we have a really problematic attacker for them. Plus the scavenging news that, you know, is a threat later. I mean, we, we've got a much better board. We look like we're in a good position. Our opponent needs engines to beat us, not just cards. I guess it's a free attack. Kind of a free block, honestly. I don't know about that play, but it, 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 I don't care a ton about the damage, but it turns my scavenging news into a 3-3. Three, three. It allows me to actually swing through a bugler. Our opponent... By the way, it must be said, they do have a spell queller up right now. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, let's attack with these and see if they are desperately want to trade the spell queller for a combat. I can't imagine. I mean, the thing is, they could block with the bugler and the spell queller on the scavenging news, and I would trade the scavenging news for the queller. The thing is, that's fine with me because then I just follow up. Uh, with a Harbinger or whatever, but the, the reality for our opponent is it's not a great position for them no matter what because we have Collected Company. Eh, wow, they want it. They actually want to make this play. Okay. I mean, this is great for me. I trade one of, what, four Scavenging Newses in my deck? Maybe three. For a Spell Queller? The Spell Queller was going to get a spell for me anyway. And gosh, now I get to just have an even more absurd turn. I, I mean, I say absurd, at least a good turn. I mean, they can selfless beard here and trade that instead, but they got no spell with the spell queller. It quelled nothing. It quelled no spells. Uh, so we traded our two drop for their two drop in the end. Not really all that bad. And now I can play what I hope is a big is a big swing. The life is not irrelevant. You know, the two life that we gain from this thing, even if we don't can't do anything else with it right now, that two life will matter over the course of the game. But it also just basically forces our opponent to have an answer immediately. They have to have um, a Skyclave Apparition or a Deputy of Detention or, or whatever. Those They have plenty of those answers, and they need one, though, for the Great Hinge. And if they do, not only do they risk just losing to a Primal Might on the Steel Leaf Champion, they get beat down by the Steel Leaf Champion regardless. Now, the Steel Leaf Champion, more than anything, might just be the most important card in the matchup because there's just so little they can do to answer it, and they have to care about it. And there you go. Look at that. They're going to... This is so bad for them. They're going to Declaration in Stone the Steel Leaf Champion. Makes sense. But gosh, so I get to crack the clue immediately and gain some life for my troubles. Now, it must be said, it's not like we're going anywhere here, right? I mean, it's not like we're in a great position. But, uh, I mean, look at what we're doing right now. We're, we get to play out creatures with the Great Hinge here. Our opponent can't do anything about it. And now I get to pass the turn back with Collected Company. So I, I was able to add to the board with a threat here with the Garrick's Harbinger. It's a 5-4. It's huge. It blocks the Militia Bugler. I guess it also gets Dust. Destroy all creatures with power three or greater. Well, they paid four mana uh, to get rid of my Garrick's Harbinger. So I think I'm okay with this exchange, especially... Uh, yeah, I mean, look, they can return everything from their graveyard to their hand, but that's going to be very slow and probably not enough. Here comes Collected Company. I think maybe for the first time this match, uh, but certainly just in time. There's a Steel Leaf Champion and a Garrick's Harbinger. That should do it. Frankly, we get the counters with the Great Hinge. We get the card draw out of it. But that'll do it. We get a block. 
and pick up the match. Well, there you go, everybody. That'll do it for Mono Green Beatdown and Pioneer. It's a deck. Now, what could we change about the deck, if anything? I think you probably want a 22nd land. I don't know if you need a 23rd, but you definitely probably want a 22nd land uh, based on our experiences there. I might cut some burning trees. They just weren't that good. They weren't that bad, but they weren't that good. If you have any pet cards, like I squeezed the Love Struck Beast in here. If you have any pet cards you want to play or you really like Galta or whatever else, the Burning Tree Emissaries are your flex slot because they're just pretty medium. Not terrible, but not very good. Outside of that, I wouldn't change much. I mean, three Nykthos is a lot, but this deck has some mana sinks uh, for sure. So I think that three Nykthos in this list makes sense. Um, you know, mana base is probably not much else to it. I, I liked everything in this. I I like the one to three beatdown strategy. I like that Garrick's Harbinger allows the deck to sort of grind through removal in a way it couldn't before. Before, if your opponents had counter spells or removal for your first I don't know, four to five good threats, all you're left with after that are dorky two twos and, and one one mana dorks on turn eight that don't do anything. So I like that Garrick's Harbinger kind of gives you a way around that. And so does the co Collected Company and the Great Hand. So you, you have, even in the matchups against, you know, a blue-white deck or something, where you have a lot of dead cards, like Primal Might or, and so on, at least you have some card advantage engines in the deck. So that's Mono Green Beatdown, everybody, here in Pioneer. This is Ponting Pioneer. I'm Corbin Hosler. Thank you so much for watching my content here on Cool Stuff. You can follow me on Twitter at Chosler, C-H-O-S-L-E-R. My podcast is Brainstorm Brewery. Um, thank you so much for watching. It's Mining Modern on the off weeks when it's not Punting Pioneer. So thanks for watching the content. I'll see you next time. Happy holidays.